what a thrill. Hi, guys. Hi, it's a thrill for Good us. Good to see you both. Um, all right, so we're going to start with the most recent and work backwards. Now, incidentally, I have two winners of the New York City Marathon sitting with me. Meb won in 2009. Catherine won the New York City Marathon in 1974. Before uh, you were born. <laughs> <laughs> So really exciting to talk with them both. And Meb, we'll start with you. Um, so this marathon, uh, your last marathon, must have been a very emotional experience. You ran an amazing race and literally left it all out on the course. So uh, tell us a little bit about your New York City Marathon experience, what it felt like, how you went about it, how you prepared, and what it was like on the day of. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And thanks to the 92 y for the opportunity to share the story with you guys. You know, I always believe that key to success is preparation. And uh, coming into th my final marathon, I gave it all that I had in training. I uh, ran about 130 miles a week. And knowing that, it's not going to be just a jog in the park, but celebration. And I wanted to be top, top 10 or top 3, or if not, then celebra celebrating in a big way. And coming on uh, this week, I had a lot of festivities, a lot of great things by, uh, presented by the New York Road Runners in honor of my 26 marathons, one marathon for each mile, and I'm 42 years old. <laughs> for those of you that are international, that's 42 kilometers, which is a, a marathon. <laughs> so kind of kind of number kind of guy, and I decided to, re to retire in New York because on my first marathon, I said, this is my first and last, and I want New York to be my first and last, and it worked out. and. Uh, Coming on Sunday, I gave it all that I had, and uh, I went for the win. I went for the top three, and went for the top ten, and uh, finished 11th. <laughs> uh, but my whole theory has been to run to win, which means to get the best out of yourself. And uh, during the race, I stopped about five, at least five times, and I pushed and pushed and pushed, but. Getting to that finish line, I squeeze every ounce of me needs to squeeze out of my body and training and in competition. And uh, it wasn't pretty at the finish line. People thought I was going to go for a push up, which I was planning on doing. <laughs> uh, but I come to the finish line, uh, I was nowhere to be, kind of have the energy. I just kind of went collapse. And uh, <laughs> it's all about getting to that finish line. A sense of relief and uh, honor to be here. And, uh, uh, retiring here in New York City Marathon where they gave me the first opportunity to show uh, my, uh, my talent. That's amazing. Nice. Now, in preparation for this marathon, I, know, I noticed you were doing a lot of events the week before because this was your uh, last marathon. Uh, do you feel like that was hard for you? Did that kind of drain you? Is that, is that you? Was that something you normally do? Because we've talked before, and I know you really try and focus uh, in the week or two weeks before. Yeah, I mean... Uh, Howie, my brother who's here, is also our agent who have been representing us, uh, Catherine and myself. Uh, I think I really believe uh, training is done 90% in before you get here. So once you come here, uh, the race week is whether you got it or you don't got it. <laughs> and uh, yes, the uh, appearances, I tally them up, I had over 30 appearances. That's amazing. I've uh, been here on Monday and uh, other things, so it was great to be able to uh, celebrate and meet and greet other people from different walks of life and runners from different worlds and my sponsors and the New York Road Runners did a great job and in including me to make sure it was a special week and definitely was a special week. And uh, I didn't think, you know, I was hydrating, I was uh, eating and, but at the same time it was like, go, 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 yeah. go the whole time. And uh, in some incidents I left uh, the race at 5.30, I didn't come home till like after 10 p.m. Most people just see me on the suit, but I have to shower at the New York Athletic Club or <laughs> do a yeah, UCAN event at the York Hotel and I go there and shower there for my runs and things like that. So it was very definitely busy, but I wouldn't trade for the yeah, world. It gives people a good sense of how much, I mean, because you were working a lot with that and then to run such an amazing race. I mean, to, to retire with a 214, 215 marathon, I mean, that's best than anybody in this room could ever do, ever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty Is anybody trying to get mad at retire retirement? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And then just a little bit about be, having kind of watched and, and watched this race and watched people's response to you along the way. And did you have a feeling, because there was such an outpouring of support, and with your name on your bib, every borough, people just so excited to see you come by. 
literally like the mayor, uh, you know, <laughs> mayor plus, uh, just in terms of kind of going by and getting such enthusiasm. Did you get a, did you feel that along the way? Almost definitely. New York came out to support not only me, but every runner, especially after what happened in Lower Manhattan. And they wanted to show resilience of a unity and sports changes everything. And for me, I, just so you were thinking, I said, this is my city. I'm going to protect it as long as I can. You know, I've been up in the front with my bib, and, uh, which is the last time it's going to be retired with the first name basis. Meb is gonna, my name, Meb, is the last time to be worn and as a competitor, but also. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody out there but, is mad, uh, big but trouble, also, <laughs> they're not gonna they're not gonna have first name basis going to New York Road Runner, so this is the end of it. And uh, but to to be here in New York and to have run so many races, my 11th time here, and people, you know, after winning New York here and after winning Boston, and kind of put the two cities together, and some of them came from Boston to support me for my last race. So it was just awesome feeling, and it was electrifying. The crowd was just amazing, and. Uh, that's the beauty of New York. You know, you go to the capital city of the world. Uh, everybody dreams to come here to just visit, and we get the chance to go through the five bros. And it, what an awesome feeling to have you, you, you know, you okay. chanting your name and going USA the whole way through. So <laughs> it was awesome. There was so much love for you. So amazing. Catherine. Um, so Catherine won the marathon in 1974 when it was only held in Central Park, which in some ways I'm guessing was even more challenging. Yeah, four hills. Four, yeah. yeah. Four, I mean, <laughs> doing four that hill once is tough enough, but doing quite, kind of four loops of that must have been quite a lot. And Catherine has uh, been a TV commentator, has ridden on the back of motorcycles multiple times uh, commenting on the marathon. But this was, in fact, your first time running through all the boroughs with the marathon we know as the New York Marathon as a runner. So. Uh, how was it for you? What was the experience like? And uh, give us the, how, your experience. Well, in a way, it was like night and day. Um, in 1974, I was very competitive and w wanted to break three hours desperately and was trained for it. But the day was almost 100 degrees and very, very, very high humidity. But as Meb knows, the day is the day is. And you have to run. Everybody has to run under the same sun. And so I gave it all I had, and I ran a 307. Um, and I was so disappointed. I mean, here, I won the New York City <laughs> Marathon, but he's really, really disappointed. Um, but but there's, a, there's a little funny thing there. There were about all of six women in the race. And, and today, still, I'm the last New York woman to win the New York City Marathon. And it is the biggest margin of victory in the history of the New York City Marathon. <laughs> I, I won by 27 minutes. <laughs> Amazing. So. <laughs> But uh, an interesting thing then happened, which was um, I ran again in 75, but then we all in the New York Roadrunners began pushing so hard to, to make this impossible dream happen of putting the race in the streets. I was slightly injured from the Boston Marathon six months before then. And um, so Fred Lebo said, hey, we've got this really neat thing called TV, and we want you to, to do TV from a motorcycle sidecar. I thought it was so cool. I got the <laughs> bomber jacket, the hat, the whole thing. And, um, and, and I was doing this commentary. That was the beginning of a, of a TV career which wound up being doing a lot of the major marathons, uh, Olympic games. And so I've been on the back of that motorcycle or in a TV studio for 28 years going through the boroughs. And I, would, I knew the neighborhoods, I knew the crowds, and I knew all the athletes. And, and what a privilege it was to be alongside of the, the greatest women runners in the world all these generations. It was just amazing to be that close to them. But I do the interview at the finish line, and then I go home, and I was flat as a pancake. Everybody else was going around town, bouncing their medals around. They'd run. You know, everybody was loaded with endorphins. And I hadn't even had a run that day. So I vowed that someday I'd run through the, the five boroughs. Well, I did well at Boston. And um, I thought, geez, I'm in good shape. I'm 70 years old. If not now, when? Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> that was. <laughs> And I have to say, as a doctor, you'll appreciate this. this. That decision was made about a week after I finished uh, Boston, so I was still in a hypoxia state <laughs> and, and totally delusional. Um, and as I got closer and closer to November the 5th, I'm saying, oh my god, what have I done for myself? But to go through those streets and have people who knew, knew my story, yeah. hundreds and hundreds of people cheering for me, and coming up from behind me, because uh, I started behind wave one, so, so people were passing me the whole time. My name was also on my back. Was your name on your back? No, of course not. Nobody's behind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody's behind.
behind me. Everybody's <laughs> behind me. They don't fish. They, they just know it's me. Anyway, um, and they would come to you and they all said thank you. And it was really, really nice. Um, and to see the crowds that close, so deep, all the way around the course, yeah, it was amazing. And you didn't even know about Shalane, I guess, until the end. No, we, you, no, 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 we knew on the course. We had all kinds of people on wireless things. The line from you, you know, the, the lineage from you to her, it must have been pretty special. It, and added benefit you didn't even know was going to happen. Well, I used to run with her mother, Cheryl, Cheryl Bridges. And, uh, and yeah. yes, isn't that amazing? Yeah. And so, of course, I followed Shalane's career. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, we were thrilled, you know. American, wonderful, great. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. And uh, how was first time you run over the Baranzano Bridge? How was that? It was windy yeah. and really cold. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, but it, the weather was funny for, uh, for me, anyway. Um, I, I wanted to wear gloves, but I was pouring water down my back. Yeah. It was a funny, it was a funny I day. Think the best analogy was uh, from my brother was running through the misting section of a grocery store. With the yes. <laughs> That's exactly. That's Which about right. Which I thought right. was uh, pretty about appropriate. Right. But it All was right. very special. And, I, and again, I too would like to thank the 92nd Street Y for organizing this wonderful evening. Um, I mean, it's an honor to, to be here with both of you guys. And, um, and to thank the New York Roadrunners and the New York PD. I mean, the organization out there was awesome. And, and the logistics, incredible, yeah. incredible. I mean, I remember the marathon after 9-11 here, and th there was a discussion we were going to have the marathon that year or not, and, uh, and ultimately it was such an empowering thing. You know, the, the terrorist incident earlier in the week here, uh, but the security was incredible, and they did such a great job organizing that. And yes, but the runners had such a wonderful empathy and a symp sympathy for the whole thing. Yeah. Um, running is wholly a force for good, and I think Agreed. that running goes and will continue to go, and I believe it will, and I hope it will continue more than ever to be the um, natural communication that we have with each other, even, it's a common language, it's like music. You know, we don't have to speak the language, we understand mm -hmm. it, we know it. And, and that'll go a long way to breaking down barriers of miscommunication and Agreed. to create peace and harmony. I truly believe that. Yeah. I mean, I'm in a marathon, I don't even know these people next to me, and yet I feel like I could trust them yeah. with my life. Absolutely. You know, really. All right, so with both of you guys, and as many of you know, both of these incredible stories, both Catherine and Meb have incredible backstories uh, that have kind of brought them to this moment. Um, I want to talk with both of you about things you've not talked a huge amount in, in public about, um, which is your families. And I, uh, having read both of their books and, and studied both of them, the one amazing commonality was, I think, the role of family in kind of getting them both to this point of, uh, both of the amazing things that they've done. Um, and so, Meb, I want to start with you. Um, and for those of you who know Meb's story of being an immigrant th from war-torn Eritrea, uh, escaping uh, basically to Italy for a while and then coming to the United States, uh, being near starvation in Eritrea, walking you know, a very long way uh, with his uh, then pregnant mother and, and siblings, eventually getting to Italy and then the United States. The one thing I was really struck about in reading your books was the role of family in your life in uh, allowing you to be successful and encouraging you to be successful from the age of, you know, from sixth grade in your math class uh, till now. So I want to start with you by talking about the role of family in making you Meb. Well, my parents gave everything they had for their kids. So uh, as you alluded to, my dad has to walk over 225 miles to save his life because he was wanted by the Ethiopian soldiers, uh, the war that lasted for 30 years, but my mom also has to stay with five kids and one on the way and hold the house, and it's not like going to the grocery store to get a fruits or flour or uh, milk. You know, you have to have harvesting and you have to do plantation, and she has to work extremely hard, and uh, after five years of separation, we reunited in Athens, Greece, where coincidentally where I won the silver medal, but I remember my dad would send us clothes and shoes, but he would only measure according to when he was living in Italy, how old, by asking how old is your son, how old is your daughter, and I have this old, that old son, and send them shoes. But as, as you know, the Italians will have three course of meal and a plus a gelato. <laughs> uh, that kind of helps with the growing, you know, whereas in Asia we barely had any food to satisfy our stomach. So the clothes and uh, shoes that he sent would usually been uh, larger than anticipated, but luckily it was uh, five brothers and one sister, so the brothers would exchange uh, and it would fit us right. But 
coming to uh, reunite in Italy or in Athens, uh, when I came out, I was the first one to greet him, and he goes, hey, Marhawi, which is my brother who's here, and he's four years younger. So the expectation of my dad as growing up was higher, and the reality was, you know, not so, 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 you know, not with his expectation, and he just went to tears. And bear in mind, my mom was just flying for the first time on a flight, all of us. First time out of the country, we didn't, have the, we didn't know the language, and she's like, don't cry about their sizes, make sure they're all together here, because for her it was a big burden to travel with six kids and not know what the, what the, where we're gonna land. And once we came to Italy, and um, uh, his boss helped us and uh, escape with his, uh, 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 previous girlfriend, uh, Letta Michael, to allow us to escape from Italy, from er Eritrea to Italy, and then when we came to the United States, you know, there was peace in Italy, but the land of opportunity is the United States. You know, you got a chance to rise slowly, and education was important to them, and, you know, once we arrived here, they expect us the best that we can to get an A in the class, whether it was history class, math class, geography, or whatever it might be, just work hard. He wo they woke us up at 4.30 a.m to learn English through the dictionary and before we went to school at 7.30. Um, so, you know, one P class just basically said, if you work hard, you're gonna get A or B. If you mess around, you're gonna get DRF. And uh, well, I don't wanna disappoint my parents. I just ran as hard as I can and my God-given talent was discovered because to get an A, you have to run 6.15 and you get a Roosevelt Junior High Mile Club t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and you get in the class, and uh, I end up running a 520 mile. And, and how old? I was I was 13. <laughs> and he goes, "You're gonna go to the Olympics." But bear in mind, we came here without the language, so I have no idea what the Olympics were. <laughs> so I have to ask my dad that evening. Uh, you know, I have two older brothers that ran, that had the T-shirt, and they got the A. I want to be like them. And <laughs> I tell him I ran a 520. He's like, "Tell the truth." I don't know, you know, and I said, Dad, I ran a 520, and, uh, and he explained to me what the Olympics were, and ever since that, it's been a magical for me, and so the importance of family is huge, because even though you don't have the money, you don't have the language, but you're there for support each other, and uh, ever since, uh, all my brothers and sisters have gone to do great things, because we had a great role models on our parents uh, to help us achieve our, our gift, and uh, whether, you know, all nine uh, out of ten brothers and sisters have gone to graduate college and done something positive to contribute to, to the society, and that would not have been possible with the, with the opportunity of the United States. So thank you, United States, and God bless the USA. Thank you. That, should, that should settle any immigration discussion we ever have in this country, yeah. ever. <laughs> uh, right? I mean, ever? That's exactly... <laughs> So it's, but, but it's amazing of the 10 siblings, all have gone on to graduate education, all have been put, and it's, I think it's a, it's a, in the Western world, it's a, it's a struggle that many parents have of how much do you push your kids versus how much do you want your kids to achieve their success on their own. And it sounds like there was some pushing and, and some expectation, but it, a lot of it came from within as well. Absolutely, for the parents it was more survival, day in, day out, we don't know what the future holds, but then when you see an opportunity, you gotta dive in and make the most of it. And uh, that's what we did and we feel blessed, you know, have great mentors, whether teachers, coaches, uh, teammates, climates who helped us kind of build the self-confidence and at the end of the day, you just gotta do what you gotta do and uh, having a good example though. We didn't have tutors, we didn't, I mean, I have my wife, Yordanos, and I have three daughters and we'll sometimes we help them out with academics, more so my wife because she's there all the time, but we like, how did our parents did this? Because she was also an immigrant from Eritrea with her family, but you know, it, for us and our household, my parents said the oldest one will help the next one and then the next one and the next one. Uh, so, you know, he did as much as he can to help us with his only seventh grade education. My mom never went to a former school, uh, but experience is the best teacher there is. And my parents just set the tone you help the next one, and then you help the next one, and we, we just wait in line and be able to, you know, just uh, look for the next tutor, you know? And, <laughs> and, 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 and the relationship between the siblings, so there's 10 of you. How's, I, I know Howie here, who's agent, uh, is, <laughs> but how's the relationship between the siblings? 
I think the relationship uh, between our siblings is great just because, you know, if we talk on a weekly basis or monthly basis or by monthly basis, it's, it's great. But and then when we get together, it's just like nothing else, you know, and no time lost in between. And they were all here this weekend uh, to watch me run my last marathons. That's great. Uh, That's yeah. great. Um, some of them first time, but most of them uh, uh, for second time or more. And uh, it's just you know now that we are a larger family we have nephews nieces and brother-in-law or sister-in-law in here and uh, my wife and her sister were here and her sister-in-law so and between family and friends we had uh, how we did an extra job as an agent as a brother <laughs> <laughs> uh, to to make sure everything was settled with the 70 plus people here to yeah. help watch me run my wow. last race so That's it was amazing. pretty special are you still the fastest guy in the family <laughs> <laughs> I still hold the record uh, as good. the fastest man. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to hear. Um, Catherine, uh, role of family in your life is interesting to me, reading your book um, and researching your history a bit, just in the sense that your parents, and it sounds like your father, but your parents were very progressive in the messaging they gave you. It sounds to me, especially because you came from a military family, which traditionally tends to be somewhat conservative, but they really encourage you to, to be you. And so I'm wondering about the role of family in your development that kind of got you to be Catherine Switzer. Well, believe it or not, it's also an immigrant story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a much older one than Meb's, but it's not it, less significant in many ways. And we didn't have the war-torn hardships, but uh, my family were Protestants in a Catholic Europe and, and um, were pers religious persecutees. I mean, mm -hmm. there's always religious persecution. Why? God knows, but anyway. Um, so they left in 1723 and came to the United States before the United States was the United States. So they went to America to find a better life. Um, and all my life, I heard about coming to America in 1723, Pennsylvania Dutch farming. Um, they, were, uh, they were dairy uh, people and farmers. And then they homesteaded west. And so they were tough. They were very, very tough people. And so I grew up on the stories of the family moving west and settling in northern Illinois, making cheese and <laughs> being dairy farmers, um, but, but living a tough life and, and, and you know, living in sod huts and stuff for a long time um, and, and raising up a family. So um, it wasn't that failure wasn't an option for me, but not trying not trying was not an option. Mm. You know, Not trying to do something better was never an option. And, um, and, and they would give you every support you could, but you had to really work hard. Also, I, was, I kind of always felt like I was never really very talented, so I felt I had to overcompensate all the time and try extra hard. Mm. Um, my dad, yeah, was in the military. He was the first guy in the military in an otherwise um, pacifist family, ah. so that was interesting. Um, and um, and very, very conservative in many ways. Um, and my brother, interestingly enough, also went in the military, and he is very, still very conservative and, and very right-wing, and I'm very, very left-wing, but we get along great. Um, anyway, um, my dad um, was astute uh, at reading a personality, and, and he saw me come home from elementary school um, at age 12, because I started school early, and I was going to high school, which was eighth grade in those days. We didn't have middle schools. And, and he saw that I was very nervous and insecure, but I was acting tough about it. And I said, I, I was, I was going to go be a cheerleader, because cheerleaders you know, were pretty and popular and dated the captain of the football team. And what he saw was a skinny little kid with frizzy hair. Some things never change. <laughs> and, um, and, he, and he said, listen, honey, you don't want to be a cheerleader. He said, cheerleaders cheer for other people. You want people to cheer for you. Life is on the field, and to participate, not to spectate. What a great and I said, oh, he said, you know what, your team, your school has something called a field hockey team, which was very new. Imagine that in like 1958 or whatever it was. Um, and he said, you should run a mile a day, and you'd be the best player on the team. I said, a mile a day, that's like climbing Kilimanjaro. <laughs> I could never do it. And he With said, that same face, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. but, but you got it all the time from your kids. Whine, whine, I can't, I can't. He said, come on, I'll show you how. Help me measure off the yard, seven laps. He said, every day, and it doesn't matter about going fast. He said, you just need to do it. And that's when I learned some of my first life lessons about how some days are easy and other days impossible, and there's no telling why. You know, and it was a Washington, D.C. summer, and it was sticky, hot, and horrible. And I struggled through this mile every day. Um, but what happened is I made the field hockey team, and I really was one of the best players, not because I had any skills, but because I had conditioning. I never got tired. I could outrun everybody. And I felt really great about myself. The most important thing is, is that I always felt better for the mile 
on the days I ran it than the days I didn't. Therefore, I never didn't run it. And I felt like I had a victory under my belt every day nobody could take away from me. And it was that sense of empowerment. I mean, I thought it was magic, okay? I didn't know it was conditioning and endorphins. <laughs> I thought it was, I Which thought is magic. it was, I thought it was magic. But I'll tell you the truth, I've been running for 58 years, it's magic. Yeah. It's magic. Absolutely. It really is. And um, uh, that, that really propelled me in every way I did because it, for women, and I think girls especially, it is running is transformational. It gives us a sense of accomplishment, um, daring, fearlessness, um, that we will try other things. We will not be afraid to take the next step to, to take on s some other project. And, and the more you build, the more you can build. And it's like, it's like taking the mile a day to 5Ks to 10Ks to a marathon. Yeah. Same thing in life. So it was, it was an amazing life lesson. My mom also was very progressive. She always worked. She always had a career, had her own money, made you know 50% of the household decisions. Um, so I grew up on that. And I also grew up on the fact that you will get a college education. You will not get married before you graduate. You will, you know, those were the givens. You know, we worked hard to save money to send you to college. You're gonna get that education. And um, it was expensive for them. And I worked a lot when I was at university. Um, but all that paid off too, you know, to, to, to do that, that struggle. Yeah, That's but amazing important. role modeling and messaging to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And, and different than many Absolutely. girls at the same time. Absolutely, because same other age. girls were getting other signals like, you know, don't run, don't climb trees. You know, if you do that, you'll turn into a man or your uterus is gonna fall out or, you know, <laughs> yeah. all, all these, these, well, those, those, are, the, those are the times of the great, not of, of the great myths because those myths, myths still survive today thousands of, for thousands of years in many countries. But in the United States, that was very prevalent. Gr girls didn't want to go into sports because their only role model was to be attractive and, and pretty and, and smell good and, and, and not sweat and, and to be attractive to the opposite sex because that was their role in life. And they didn't see anything else. So, you know, you know talent capability is everywhere. I say this all the time. Yeah. But people can't understand that until they have an opportunity. Mm. So it only needs an opportunity. And, and that's what I was given, to open up a new a new vision for me. Amazing. I was very, very grateful to my parents. I love it. Yeah. All right, so now what we're gonna do is, again, both of these stories are so rich and, and, and each could take up many hours. Um, so what I've done is I've tried to select a few different moments from Meb and Catherine's lives, which I think I found to be really interesting. And I wanted to ask them about those moments in their lives to try and expand upon how they, what that meant to them. So Meb, I'll start. And Catherine, you're gonna get the same first question, so you can sure. think about it a bit. Um, I get to prep. <laughs> which is, Meb, when did you realize uh, the first time that you were a runner? I think uh, first time I realized I was gonna be a runner was that, I told you, I mentioned the letter a bit earlier in seventh grade, and uh, basically my brothers were having a t-shirt and getting A in the class, and. Coach Declore says, if you run hard, you're going to get A or a B, and if you mess around, you're going to get a DRF. I don't want to disappoint my parents or I want to get that A and the T-shirt, and I just ran as hard as I can, and end up, it wasn't around the track. It was more like around the middle school, uh, softball field, go to the middle of the campus, up around the uh, baseball field, and finish in the middle of the campus, mm -hmm. and I just did a couple months ago with him to go over the stuff for a documentary reason, and uh, you know, he said, I have to keep an eye on both of them because, you know, there's some people that just want to goof around and here you are way up there uh, running and uh, end up running the 520 mile. And uh, he says, he looked at his watch, he was very surprised and he says, you're going to go to the Olympics. So I was in seventh grade and uh, I didn't know what the word Olympics mean. Bear in mind, that was 1988. I'm pretty sure school started in September. Maybe the Seoul Olympics would just get down or mm -hmm. just get started. But... Uh, Growing up uh, without electricity and running water, I have no, I never watched TV until I was 10 years old. And uh, to be told in seventh grade that you're gonna be an Olympian, you're like, okay, could I get my A? <laughs> 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 and I get the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the uh, shirt. Uh, but that's when, you know, the end that you put your, your, your picture in the gym. So there's Mabratum Kafleski in seventh grade and 520 and they're like, the, all the students are like, wow, how did you do that? And, you know, they give you thumbs up or give you a high five. And I got to know him to be the fastest seventh grader in the school. And uh, I wanted to improve. And improvement comes, he said, if you run within 30 seconds of that 6.15, you get an A. If not, within one minute, you get a B and all that. He was explaining to me 
Not that I knew when I didn't speak English or he explained it at the time, <laughs> but I recollect with him when he was explained a couple months ago, and I, it was very incremental for me, 520, 517, 515, uh, 512 maybe, and then 510 by the end of the year. So it was milliseconds basically, and uh, that's when I kind of realized boy, that was my God-given talent. But the yeah. honest truth, when I, it was academics first, athletics second, academic first, Athletic second, the same thing at UCLA. When I won four NCAA title, UCLA is when I said, maybe I could do this as a profession. I consider <laughs> maybe I should, I should go to pro. But and then I said, you know what? That diploma is going to mean so much to me. Make sure I graduate from UCLA. And once I graduate from uh, UCLA in '99, then ever since until Sunday, I give running a priority. Now <laughs> the family will take a priority. <laughs> Now, uh, spending time with my daughters and my wife and my brothers and sisters and my parents will take priority, but for the last 27 years, that's what I've been uh, pursuing. Try to every stride, every race, so much pressure to just whether it's to make a cross country team or trying to le win league or then state title, you qualify as a state title, maybe it's like, okay, I made it as a freshman, but can I win this as a senior? So there's always goal setting going on and then NCAA, the same thing. And then as a uh, USA championship, the same thing as well. It's like, well, if I could win one national title, I would be so happy. <laughs> and then you end up, uh, end up winning 23 eventually down the road. And you know, you want to make Olympic team, but then say, well, I'm happy to represent our country in the Olympics, but can I do a better winning a medal for our country? And that happens. And then set another goal, can I win New York, which has uh, been on my first mind since I stepped here 15 years ago in November 2002. And then you want to make that goal come and then win in Boston. That would be been my goal for a long time. And now I feel like that, you know, that has plateaued. I'm delighted with my career and I squeezed every ounce there was to squeeze out and uh, come that finish line, I was just done. <laughs> 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 and uh, incoherent, I was delusional and I was just, I stopped about five, six times and, but I want to get to that finish line because that was pretty important to me. And uh, the New Yorker runners have put a nice touch to said, this is my 26th marathon, MEP 26 marathon, so. <laughs> uh, from seventh grade till, that was 1988, till 2017, it's pretty long it's a span long. of time. It's like a marathon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, and also, from reading, it sounded like you, you loved soccer, too, as a young kid, and, and, and you just became better at running, but soccer was a, it sounds like a big love as well. Uh, I played in soccer in Eritrea with a mech shift, basically. You know, I have my CP c compression socks here, but <laughs> uh, stuff it in with, uh, with plastic and, it's, and, and then make a two round of it so you can have a second layer because it wasn't grass. It was dirt and pebble rocks and things like that. So. Uh, that was how I played soccer, and then when I went to Italy, um, uh, I was known as to be the Pele. Uh, <laughs> I had hair, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Pele and Abel Kila, which uh, happened to receive this award this w uh, this week uh, for by the New Yorker Runners, Abel Kila, who was the first East African African to win a gold in the m in the marathon, 1960 and 1964. First time he did it was barefoot, and uh, to get receive that award was huge to me. And uh, those are the two athletes that I got to know. My my parent, my dad told us about him, and uh, you know, I played in top to ninth grade, and then I had to make a tough decision. Uh, my two oldest brothers, who I wanted to get tissue like them, they were playing soccer, and I wanted to be a soccer player like them. But there was a little conversation with a soccer uh, coach at high school, and uh, I said, you know, I overheard my dad saying my my. Not the oldest, but the middle between my uh, between me and my oldest brother, Akhilu, his name, and he says, choose one and do it really well, because the soccer player wants uh, coach wants you to play soccer year round, the running coach wants you to run year round. So there was a little bit of favorism, whoever put more time, kind of thing. And I said, you know what? I don't want to deal with that. Once the gun goes off, it's fair and square. Whoever gets there first will do that, and that's the reason I decided to do running. And sometimes I said. Could I have been a soccer player professionally, but I'm happy with my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are we. In sixth grade, was it was it all the kids lined up at once, or they just sent you one at a time around the playground for the uh, mile? In seventh grade, it was uh, everybody together. Everybody together on a tennis court. You know, there's a um, fence here, and the, where you play single tennis, mm -hmm. I guess, against the wall. Next to the San Diego Zoo. If you ever in San Diego, they have a beautiful zoo, and uh, next to it is called Roosevelt Junior High, and he would just say. 
on your mark, go, go about 100 meters and make a right turn and go around <laughs> the base softball field and then go to the ramp around the middle of the campus and then go to another ramp to the softball, <laughs> uh, baseball field and then you come back and finish the mission of the campus. So, no, it was just, you go and uh, it was a great coach to Claude. He said, you run, sometimes you make you run seven minutes, see how many laps you can run in this baseball field, and then other times you run 600 meters, see how time, and then the most notable obviously was a mile where, you know, that you get a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Love the shirt, man. <laughs> I should make this shirt, this is like, uh, Catherine has 261, fearless, yeah. and I should make a Roosevelt Junior High. Roosevelt shirt. Junior, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt Junior High, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Catherine, same question to you. When did you realize, so you were running a mile a day as an adolescent. Yes. When did you realize you were a runner? When was the first time you recognized that you were a runner? Well, I, you gotta understand the era um, that it was very unusual even to have women's or girls' sports in high school. And we were lucky enough to have a field hockey team and a basketball team. And um, so I wanted to play on both of those teams because they were, they were offered. So I ran the mile a day and I played field hockey um, all, all four years of high school and basketball as well. But then I realized that going to college, you know, I was out in the summer and I was running and, and by that time I was running three miles a day because I thought if the magic was good for one mile, it was gonna be great for three miles. <laughs> and, um, but I also wanted to prepare myself for college. I, and when I got to Syracuse University, I was amazed that, um, this is way pre-Title pre IX, and let's get, let's get a fix on this. The, the longest event in the Olympic Games uh, for women was, um, in, in that year was uh, in 1960, they introduced an 800 meters, okay? It was, yeah, that's, and that was after cutting the 800 out of the 1928 Olympics and they didn't reinstall it for, for 32 years because, you know, women were too weak and too fragile to run 800 meters. So they decided it was too dangerous and they, they cut it. Um, so I didn't have any real role models for running and, and, and it, there was no track team and there was no Title IX, et, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, when I got to Syracuse, it was astonishing for me because the men had 25 sports, all of them deep in scholarships, and women had nothing. They had play days. And I, I was really sort of shattered by this. Um, and I thought, well, okay, maybe women just don't want to, to take part in sports. And then I was out running and I thought, what can I do? Because even after university, there's not going to be any sports for me. And I went to Syracuse because I love sports and I wanted to write about them and I wanted a journalism mm. degree. Mm. And so I thought if I could work at what I loved, then it wouldn't be like going to work. And, and then I thought, well, what can I do? I'll always run. And I loved the running and I had this sense of empowerment, but I never, I never had the opportunity to really think of myself as a competitive runner. But it was at Syracuse where I met um, I went out and asked the coach if I could run on the men's cross country team. And um, he said, no, not, it's against <laughs> NCAA rules, but we'd welcome you to train with the team, thinking I'd never show up. I showed up. That's my, the secret of my success is I show up. Okay. <laughs> it's, and it's not my line, it's Woody Allen's line. I know he's a little disturbed, but I mean, he's really right on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely true. Anyway, so, um, so I showed up and um, all the guys were wonderful to me. I mean, I'd never seen that in sports, in men treating women this way. They were wonderful. Really sensitive new age guys, and this was the eve of the women's liberation movement. I thought they'd think I was out there to be in their face. No, they so were this early, mid-1960s at Syracuse, yeah. This is 1966, the mm -hmm. autumn of 66. And the, you know, Betty Friedan had just written The Feminine Mystique. Mm -hmm. I know, you don't even know what I'm talking about out there, you guys. <laughs> but anyway, um, and, and, but I was very sensitive that these guys think, would think I was trying to barge in on something. Yeah. And, Instead, they welcomed me. And one guy in particular was a volunteer coach. He wasn't even a real coach. He was just a volunteer coach. And he had, a, he, he, um, had run with the team for 30 years uh, as a runner, and he was still the upstate New York marathon champion. When I met him, he was ancient. He was 50. <laughs> and he had, a, had <laughs> broken, broken down knees, broken down Achilles. But he felt so sorry for me. I got lost on the cross country course every day. He could still keep up. He could still keep up with me, even injured. Anyway, he would tell me about um, the one day in his life when he felt like the hero in his life, and it was the day he ran the Boston Marathon. And so, and he, and I loved this guy. He was a mailman, and he would schlep through the snow and shit of Syracuse from October to May. We didn't see bare ground, canyons of snow. You guys, anybody from upstate knows it. I'm not lying about this. Um, to go out and train in the afternoon 
and so that he could be ready for the Boston Marathon every April, and he had run 15 Boston Marathons, and told me all these stories about Clarence DeMar and Johnny Kelly the Elder and Johnny Kelly the Younger, and he got over his injuries running slowly with me. And then one day in a blizzard, I told him I wanted to run the Boston Marathon too, and he said, a woman can't run the Boston Marathon. And I said, why ever not? And he said, he said women are too weak and too fragile. And I got mad. I said, we were running 10 miles in the blizzard in the middle of the night, and you're telling me I, I, can't, I can't run a marathon? And he said, he said, 10 miles is not 26. And I said, I know that, Arnie. And he said, well, with women, it gets harder as it gets longer, you know, and that the, the marathon gets harder as it gets longer. And I said, no kidding. You know, it's the whole point. Anyway, um, we argued. I told him about other women who had run distances, about my pioneering ancestors. Um, I told him about Roberta Gibb, who jumped out of the bushes in Boston in 66 and, went and, and ran the race. She did. He exploded with rage and said, no dame ever ran no marathon. And, and then I said, you don't have a training partner. And he said, all right. He said, if you'd show me in practice, I'd be the first person to take you. What's, what's the secret of success, you know? You have a goal and a challenge and um, a coach if you're lucky, and if you're really lucky, a buddy. I had my buddy, and we trained, and, um, and I think it's when I ran 31 miles in the training practice, and he passed out at the end of the workout. <laughs> That'll do it. And said when he came to, he said, you women have hidden potential in endurance and stamina. <laughs> that, you think? <laughs> that, that, I, that That's when I knew I was yeah. running. Be I love it. Because it wasn't about being fast, it also could be about being long. And I know I'm getting ahead of myself right now, but I'd like everybody just to remember like, what has happened in the last 50 years. We have gone from a um, you know, man trying to throw me out of the Boston Marathon, as it turned out, to now more women runners in the United States than men. And we're realizing that these women are running for, for a couple of reasons. One, it empowers them, like it did me, but also because they're good at it. Women are very, yeah. very good in endurance and stamina and better than men. So give us six day races, give us 100 miles, you know, give us ultras, we're winning outright in many, many cases. And we also have more flexibility and balance. But this is not a men versus women story. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it isn't, it isn't. It's about, it's about guys will always have more speed, strength, and power. It's just that like Olympic sports for a you know, few thousand years have been about that because women didn't have the opportunity to yeah. prove anything else. Absolutely. So now we're going to, it's going to be changing completely and you guys are the generation that's going to be changing that. It's going to be a very, very exciting future. Very exciting future. All right. We have about 10 minutes left, which is just unfortunate because I could talk to these guys for another hour uh, at least. Uh, so I'm going to ask you each one other moment. And I had written down four moments for each of you, and I, want, I would love to ask them all. Meb, I think I'm going to ask you about taking us back to 2014 in Boston, when at the age of 39, oh, wonderful. the year <laughs> after the Boston Marathon bombing, with the names of all the victims written on your bib, you won the Boston Marathon. Uh, all right, take I us guess ready to be here for uh, two <laughs> hours and eight minutes. <laughs> uh, you know, I was at the Boston Marathon 2013 and, and I left five minutes prior to the, to the bombing and because I usually don't get a chance to f see my fellow runners finish because of drug testing or media obligations. So I sat there for four, four and a half hours and tell my brother how I need to go to do a TV analysis for universe, Universal Sports. So I went to the hotel and the bombing occurred and I, how, I'm like, how can it be? There's no way. And uh, uh, Bonnie Ford happened to be uh, at the, that afternoon. She says, are you gonna come back or are you fearful that this might happen? I said, I am gonna come back, but I just hope to be healthy to win it for the people. That goal was set that afternoon. And uh, in fact, before the, I left the, st the grandstand, I sent a text to Ryan Hall that says, hey, we can do this. So that day was full of empowerment or uh, visualization of what next year is gonna happen. I just didn't know the horrific moment is gonna occur. Uh, and uh, so basically, for 365 days or so, I was caring what can I do positive, what can I do positive, and 36,000 people lined up to own Boylston Street, and uh, I was just been the, been the fortunate ones to be able to give it a shot. My training was great, it wasn't like incredible, but I was happy with it to be healthy, and uh, I tell my mentor Bob Larson before we left the starting to the starting line, five minutes before or so, I said, 
don't worry, you're not going to see me in the front until the last five kilometers. But as uh, some of you might know that uh, <laughs> you have to use your intuition, you have to seize the moment. And I saw the guys, the number one, number two rank in the world were there, and the defending champion was there. And I, I saw they were trying to slow it down and go pace. My goal was to, to win top three or run a personal best. Uh, went for it and there was slogan Boston Strong, go out there and uh, uh, give them map strong. I happened to put the, n the night before the, uh, the names of the victims uh, on my bib to draw inspiration as a Boston Strong and I'm giving map strong and see what happens. And as the race unfolded basically, uh, it was a two man race with Joseph R. Boyd up to eight miles. Athlete get in the zone. I don't remember going through Wesley, which is uh, a lot of crowd and a lot of ladies. I don't remember going through it. <laughs> I was in the zone and uh, basically just kept going and going. And uh, you know, that 520 miles that I ran in seventh grade, that just became a 430 of mile 16 and still got 10 miles to go. Uh, I went making a right hand turn, Boston's point to point, making a right turn on uh, the fire station. I was hurting pretty bad. I was just in pain, but I'm like, I got to do it for the United States, just keep pushing and pushing. And I ruptured my quad at that point in 2010, and those memories do come back to you. And going through Newton Hills, just challenging and challenging. And uh, basically, I didn't, s something told me to look to the right with 5K to go. I saw, been, you know, I saw a guy, and I said, three things came to mind. Slow down, save your energy for Boston Street, try to maintain the gap, or try to extend the gap. I said, the rule number one, that first goal is not good because when a runner's chasing you, they come next to you, they got the mental edge over you. So I said, just ignore that plan, just maintain the gap and try to extend the gap and coming on the boils, making a right on Hereford. And uh, I just said, the next 100 meter is my finish line. Just sprint as hard as you can. By the time he makes the turn, make sure that the gap is bigger. And that's what I did. And I crossed myself going to Boston Street. It's not over. So many people have lost the race in that, that moment, but it's about a 600, 800 meter. Don't trip. Don't ha pull a hamstring. <laughs> keep, keep mechanics, mechanics, and I just uh, wanted to do something positive. That was my vision to do something positive. When the Red Sox won and put that trophy at the finish line, I said I want to do that for runners on the Patriots Day. And it was great to be an American to be able to pull the victory for all of us and lead the 36,000 people chanting USA, USA on Boston Street. And uh, my life changed ever since. Mm. And when in that race, uh, and I've watched the video many times of coming down Boylston Street, and every time I see it, it's just an amazing video of just summoning every ounce of determination and courage and focus and drive. When in that race, because I saw you looking back a few times, and then you pick up your sunglasses <laughs> when you get close to the end, when did you feel like, all right, I'm, I'm going to win this race? The race is never over until the <laughs> tape touches your chest. <laughs> uh, but I mean, coming to making that le left turn on uh, Boylston, I know I had it, but the police was escorting us, and if they pick it up, they're gonna pick it up. If I slow down, they're gonna slow down with the camera, so I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and uh, you know, it's like I said, it's not over until uh, the, the, t the tape touches your chest, and uh, I knew going to the race was a, memorable moment in my life and I took the sunglasses off and you know it's my it was my dream to win the Boston Marathon and I tried it's not for lack of trying but that day that moment it was greater than our, all ourselves it was just something special and uh, uh, and and you want to be able to deliver and you know whether it was Ryan whether it was me was an American where Shalane she ran her heart out I mean it was just you know uh, we needed an American to win it no matter who was, but we needed an American to do it, and I just feel honored and privileged to be able to have come across that finish line. Mm. And it's never, you know, coming to that finish line, I remember it was greeted by my wife, and uh, uh, this only race, my parents weren't in there to watch me run, but Howie was there, my mentor Bob Larson was there, so it was just uh, tears of joy because sense of relief, because sometimes you carry on your shoulder, you want to do something positive, and it's often that, not often that, all the things align really well for a marathon, and it did for me that moment. If you've not seen the video of Meb winning the Boston Marathon, you, I, everybody go home tonight on YouTube, and everybody watching, 
watch that video. It's just such a powerful moment in the second. Do you remember what you were thinking the second you hit the, the tape there at the end with your arms up in the air? It must, must have been an amazing moment. I mean, I looked up to the sky and thank God for the opportunities because as Kathy said, it's opportunities. When the opportunity comes, you can shine. But if the opportunities are not there, you never know what you can and can't do. But I just felt, uh, you know, if it wasn't for that fourth place finish at the London Olympic Games, would I have been in Boston? It was a question. And, <sighs> and so one, you know, disappointment, not getting a medal in, in, in London, you can look at it as a failure. But for me, it was a hope that, hey, I still can challenge. It was supposed to be my last Olympics. Uh, it could still challenge to win New York, or still challenge to win Boston, and that opened the doors for you and for me. And then when o doors open, you do the best that you can because others are counting on you. You're not just running for yourself, but for your family, for your sponsors, for your country. And at that point, Boston needed that victory, and I just I was very fortunate. Amazing to think of the six-year-old guy <laughs> in Eritrea, uh, you know, walking barefoot, e eating dirt, starvation almost to finishing uh, in that. It's just an amazing story, amazing. Um, Catherine, for your moment, and I have many for you as well, um, but I think I wanna ask you about your experience 50 years after yeah. running the Boston Marathon as the first registered woman. Uh, and the pictures of Catherine uh, being pulled out of the race, trying to be pulled out of the race, and, uh, and then running on and, and breaking so many barriers and setting so many precedents for female athletes around the world is incredible. But I'm, I'm most curious about uh, 50 years later, reflecting on all the change that had happened since that day and what that experience was like for you 50 years later going back to the same right. place. I, I think that, um, just I have to preface that by saying that um, in 1967, after the official attacked me, um, I made the decision that I was going to finish that race no matter what. On my hands and my knees, if I had to, I was going to finish the race. And I, and I often think, how did a 20-year-old girl have the presence of mind with the press truck in front of her? I mean, I was just there to run, um, to de determine to finish that race. And it was because I think I'd started running when I was 12. You know, I had the victory under the belt, and I didn't want it to be taken away. But more than that, I didn't want people to think a girl was a quitter you know, that women couldn't do it. I wanted to absolutely prove that we deserved to be there at that point, that everything changed. It really became then a determination to finish. So um, it was a hard race in, in 67. It was cold, it was windy, it was snowing and sleeting, headwind the whole way. We were miserable, um, but I did finish. And I, and I knew after that nothing was gonna be as hard as that day. And that was really made me strong for the rest of my life. Um, so 50 years later, and how did that happen? I mean, I ran Boston eight times. I helped get women official in the Boston Marathon. I helped get the uh, Olympics happen. And, and, and I have to always thank that official because he gave me the inspiration, as negative as it was. Meb talks about the fourth place being an incentive in, in the Olympics. Well, you know, when somebody tells you you can't do something and, 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 and other people tell you you can't, it really fires your imagination and, and you just, I determined how I could make it happen for women. And again, it was the opportunity thing and I wrote a, a very big business proposal. I took it to Avon, the world's largest cosmetics company at the time and created a global circuit of races for women um, in 27 countries and, and I could take that to the Olympic Games and we got the women's marathon in the Olympic Games. And that, that was my career, I mean, and that in television, um, I always jogged and ran. I mean, after I had a pretty competitive career, I did do well at Boston. I did run a 251, and that, that was, um, when I ran that, I knew if I could do that, anybody could do it. I mean, I'm not kidding, I had to work <laughs> so hard, but hard work really often trumps talent, really. And, um, and I said, okay, now there's a lot of talent that needs the help, so I wanted to create that program. So that became the career, but I stayed in shape. And um, the marathon bug got me again in my, my early 60s when I saw older women running and they were running events I helped create that I hadn't run, you know? I hadn't run in them, I'd televised them or, or I'd organized it. And I thought, I wonder if I could get it back. So I was physiologically curious, trained back up, and started running marathons again. And I saw, thought, well, I'm in pretty good shape. I could do this 50 years later, maybe for Boston. Wouldn't that be a great celebration? At the same time, the most amazing thing happened, and that is that this old bib number suddenly became this kind of cult magic number around the world, meaning fearless in the face of adversity. And I was getting emails and photographs all over the world. People were sending me, showing me they were wearing 261. And, and, I, um, and I thought, what is this weird synchronicity? 
Well, when they started sending me pictures of their tattoos, I really had to take it seriously. <laughs> and because it was a powerful statement, and I couldn't figure out what they were quite trying to tell me. And it suddenly dawned on me that all of us have been told at one time or the other, we're not good enough, we're not welcome. You don't belong here, you're the wrong race, you're the wrong color, you're from the wrong country. You don't belong, and you go and you run and you feel fearless and you do it anyway. So you become fearless, and I thought, that's what they're telling me. So we created a nonprofit, you know, a 501c3 where we're gonna take this fearless message through running around the world. Well, I thought, wow, at Boston, for my 50th anniversary, which I'm doing out of gratitude and celebration for this amazing 50 years, maybe the BAA will be, sh be kind to me and give me some charity bibs for my, my charity, and they did. And then other people wanted to run who were already qualified. In the end, we had 117 women and seven intrepid guys who ran on the 261 Fearless team in Boston last year, raising money for the charity. So I, there we were, we were, it's become now a very big promotion and, 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 and everybody's excited about the fact that a woman is going to run a marathon 50 years after she first did. As it turns out, I was the only woman who at that point had done that. Not a, that is not testimony to my greatness, I'll tell you. It's only because so few women ran 50 years ago. Um, <laughs> and, and plenty of women, of course, at 70, 75, 80, 90 have run marathons. So that, that wasn't unusual. But the press was fascinated with it. When I got to Boston, I was just bombed with interviews. It was an avalanche. It really, really was. Um, and by the time the race began, my legs felt like cooked spaghetti. I really felt like cooked spaghetti. And I thought, oh boy, what am I gonna do here? I mean, I couldn't sleep, I really couldn't keep food down. It was really, I was under so much pressure. And I thought, my God, people are gonna remember me more for not finishing than finishing. <laughs> um, maybe I'll die or something terrible, <laughs> right, you know? Um, and also people were, abs they were fascinated by, by, they were thinking I was old. And at, at 70, it never, I mean, I feel like I'm 25, so it did not occur to me that I was actually 70. Um, and, and, then, and then the run is magic. You know, I, t I said to my team, I said, I'm dialing in this back, I'm dialing this way back. All we're gonna do is just try to finish the race. We're gonna walk every water station. We had a lot of interviews to do along the route. Let's just have fun and just try to finish the race. Every mile got faster. I mean, we did eight interviews. I walked every water station and I ran the Boston Marathon only 24 minutes slower than I did when I was 20. So that was amazing That's to amazing. me. That was really amazing to me. But it all came to me. And I mean, you could just you follow the photographs of me going through the race. The stress is coming off my face. I'm getting better and better and better. People were screaming, 261, 261, you know, go women, go Catherine. Hundreds of people I did who I never met in my life. The other thing that was amazing is th the route itself came back to me like that. I'd gone out to Boston, I swear, five or six times, to tr I mean to Hopkinton, five or six times, to try to find the exact place where Jock Semple attacked me in the race in 67. I could never find it. I assumed they put up a parking lot, a new building, whatever. <laughs> Couldn't find it anywhere. And as soon as I ran past it, I said, that's it. There it is. And all along the way, I suddenly the clock, the, the Wellesley, all these different places just came to me. And um, by the end, you know, the, the crew who was running with me said, we want you to slow down. We gotta get to the finish ahead of you. I said, I'm not slowing down, I'm on a BQ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for it, go, go for it. And, and coming, you know, right on Hereford, left on Boylston. Yeah, no and as we made the left on Boylston, um, oh my gosh, it's the world's uh, kind of opened up like a panoply, right? And I could see down on the finish line, um, Joanne Flaminio, the first president, woman president of the Boston Athletic Association in 125 years, was there to greet me with the medal, and standing next to her was my beloved husband, Roger Robinson, who's here tonight. And you know, we all have this fantasy of finishing the race, you get the medal, and then you kiss your lover, right? So I came across the finish line and, and got the medal from Joanne, gave her a quick hug, and gave Roger the most embarrassing, lingering kiss that, that, that the media were filming, and then they go, Gosh! <laughs> um, I think in some, and maybe you feel this way too, um, that was, I think, the happiest day of my life. And, and, and I, you know, was my wedding the happiest day of my life? Y sure, but, but, <laughs> um, but, but Roger was a part of this, and it was, for me, 50 years of really hard work, yeah. and passing the torch 
to the next generation. And I felt relieved that, the, that this torch of equality, fearlessness, 261, everything is in very, very good hands. I'm not gonna be around in 50 years, but you guys are gonna be around in 50 years. And, and you know, we had made such huge advances in, in women's um, a progress and empowerment in industrialized nations for, through running. The simple, cheap, accessible act of running. And, and if we can take that, and we are now, gonna take that to countries where women have no opportunities whatsoever. We can, we can change the world. Change women, change the world. And, and if people are fearful, and most women in the world still live in a fearful situation, that's the sad part of the story. If we can get them to get just a sense of fearlessness from somebody by putting one foot in front of the other like we got, we can go such a long way. And I, I felt, therefore, very relieved and full of gratitude. I'm sure that's the way you felt. The sense of gratitude was overwhelming to me to have the health to do that um, and to have the support and the wonderful people and the belief of carrying it forward mm. just made all the difference to me. I love it. I could Thank talk you. to you guys you. all night, uh, but unfortunately our time is up here. Uh, first of all, can we just have a standing ovation for these two amazing people? Oh. <laughs>